The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If I could ask everyone in our radio audience why they are paying special attention tonight, thousands would say, I received a postcard this morning from a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society inviting me to hear tonight's middle commercial. It sounds mighty important to me. Yes, the Equitable Society invites all of you to hear tonight's middle commercial about the Equitable Society's Independent 60s Plan, a practical, workable plan for people who want to enjoy complete independence in their 60s. I'll be back in approximately 14 minutes to give you full information on this special plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, Out of the Storm. A war has been going on in this country since the birth of the nation in 1776. We refer to the war against crime, a constant battle which is being waged on every front 24 hours a day between criminal and law enforcement agencies. In this fight, the criminal enjoys one great advantage. He and he alone decides when a crime shall be committed. Sometimes it is possible for the special agents of your FBI or for your local police to be on the scene and to prevent that crime. But for obvious reasons, that rarely happens. In most cases, it is possible for the lawbreaker to strike and run. The problem of crime prevention is complex and not one which can be dismissed by the recital of a simple panacea. However, there is one thing which more and more crime commissions are recommending after their studies. That is to enlarge your local police force. For the past 20 years, the population of every big city has jumped appreciably, and yet, in most cases, the police have remained at the same strength they had in the 1920s. Enlarging a police force costs money, which means taxes, which means that you have to foot the bill. Cost is an important item, not only in these days, but all the time. However, money spent for law enforcement is an investment in the future. An investment that will pay off with a victory in this 173-year war. The war against crime. Tonight's file opens in a small frame house located in the sparse suburbs of a western city. It is night. A summer storm sends vivid flashes of lightning into the living room of this dwelling. In this room, a middle-aged man sits reading to his daughter. As Jennifer entered the room, the dark, foreboding room she had hated even as a little girl, she felt the presence of someone, some intruder. Quickly, she ran to the light switch. She clicked it. The Stygian blackness of the room remained. Someone had cut the wires. Go on, Father. As she stood there petrified, someone slammed the door. She could hear their footsteps running down the long marble hallway. She opened the door to follow the mysterious visitor, and as she did so, a strong beam of light fell across the carpet, and Jennifer saw something on the floor near the window. It was a body, the body of her brother. I knew it. No more tonight, Dan. But you can't stop reading now. We'll finish it tomorrow night. Father? What was that? Thunder? No. No, I heard footsteps, Father. There's someone outside. You hear someone? Yes. Well, I'll see who it is. No, 
down there. That's odd. I was sure I... I... That story I read you that made you... There, you see, I knew someone was there. Mr. Sandy? Yeah? I'm Albert Brewster. I've got a letter of introduction to you. Come inside. Thank you. Here, let me have your coat. Thanks. Who is it, Father? It's a Mr. Brewster. This is my daughter, Annie. How do you do? Hello? May I see the letter, please? Surely. Here you are. Mr. Brewster? Yes? Why did you stand outside so long? What do you mean? You were outside when Father opened the door the first time. I, I heard your footsteps. You heard me in all this storm. I can't see, Mr. Brewster. I depend on my sense of hearing. Oh. Why did you stand outside? Well, I wasn't sure I had the right so place. So you're the new man in this territory for Shelby Jewelry. Yes, sir. What does he want, Father? Mr. Brewster's company sent me some stock on consignment. I haven't been able to move it, so he's going to take it back. Oh. Would it be too late to go down to the store now, sir? Yes, I'm afraid it would be. Well, I've we'll got some business tomorrow morning about a hundred miles from here. Well, if I could get it tonight... I'm sorry, Mr. Brewster. Not in this storm. Well, I... I have a problem, sir. What's that? I stopped at the hotel on my way through town. And I pull up. If you don't give me the jewelry now, I have no place to stay. Oh. Well, I guess you can stay here tonight, Mr. Brewster. I'll get the jewelry for you in the morning. Same evening at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Earl Conrad approaches. Hello, Jim. Oh, hi, Earl. Well, welcome back to the office. Thanks. I see we're working on a case together. Yeah, that's right. What is it? Well, grab a chair. I'll fill you in on it. Oh, fine. There's a small trunk line railroad that runs from here to Salt Lake City and then heads north. Oh, I know that line. No? Well, it runs parallel to the highway for quite a way. Then they both run past an old army camp that used to be called Camp Waterbury. Camp Waterbury? Yeah. <laughs> I was stationed there before I went overseas, Jim. <laughs> that must be why the SAC put you on the case. <laughs> what kind is it, Jim? A oh, body was found beside the railroad tracks and property that's part of the army camp. Oh? Uh, murder? Well, at first, I didn't think so. Well, why not? Well, I went up there. The first thing I did was to examine the body. He was dressed in ragged clothes. Uh-huh. He had a bad head wound and... I thought he might have been killed falling off a train. Tracks take a pretty bad curve right at that spot. Then closer examination showed he had a fresh haircut, clean shave, and a new manicure. It doesn't sound like a tramp. No, I was sure he wasn't. Any idea who he was? No. I contacted the nearby towns. They have no one reported missing. It still leaves a lot of territory to be checked. Yeah? How about fingerprints, Jim? I sent them along to Washington as soon as I got them. I've been expecting an answer momentarily. Mm-hmm. You, uh think we ought to go back up to the camp? Well, the SAC wants us to wait till we hear from Iden in Washington. As soon as we do, we start moving. Sanders. I thought you went to bed. I got thirsty. Wanted a glass of water. You've been in every room but the kitchen. I'm just trying to find my way around. The kitchen is behind me. I'll show you. All right. Where the light? Oh, sorry. Find your way around. Here's a glass. Thank you. You didn't drink the water, Mr. Brewster. How do you know? I didn't hear you. Oh. You really hear good? That's right. I know there's a car going up the dirt road of the cave right now. What cave? The one up the hill. Leads to an underground lake. I don't hear any car. 
hearing practice like a sense of touch. I've had to develop that, too. For instance, I can tell about most people by their hands. Yours are deceptive, though. Why? You're a jewelry salesman. When you came in tonight and we shook hands, I expected yours to be soft. But they were hard. Very hard. Calloused. Want another glass of water, Mr. Brewster? No, thanks. And I think we'd better get back upstairs. All right. Good night, Miss Sanders. Got lucky, Earl. What do you mean, Jim? Well, the report just came in from my end. The man didn't have a criminal record. I don't understand what you mean by lucky. Oh, he took a civil service exam two years ago and filed his prints with the application. Oh. His name was Albert Brewster. Well, what'd you get on him? He was a jewelry salesman. How'd you find that out? Well, I got the address he gave on his application and put in a call. Uh Uh-huh. Married? Yeah. I had to give the news to his wife. Ouch. That's a rough assignment. Yeah. This one was doubly rough. Mrs. Brewster just had a baby a month ago. Yeah. I guess the motive was robbery. Well, sure sounds like it. Any idea how much jewelry Brewster was carrying? No, not yet. His wife told me he was working for the Shelby Jewelry Company in New York. Well, with the time difference, their offices are closed by now. Mm Mm-hmm. Could she give you any other information? Uh, She said that her husband was traveling this territory for the first time. On a train? No, he was traveling by car. Companies? No, his own. And the murderer must have taken the car, too. Any description on it? Yeah, complete. He could have covered a lot of territory in two days, not telling where he is. Well, if he's on the road with the car, we've got a good chance. I sent out a five-state alarm. Oh, good. Well, nothing else to do tonight, Earl. Let's meet back here tomorrow morning and put that call through to the Shelby Company. Right. And as soon as we get his route from them, we can start our search for the killer. Who's there? Who is it? Me. Annie. What are you doing up at this hour? Father. Father, I've got to talk to you. Is the storm disturbing you, dear? No, I want to talk about Mr. Brewster. What about it? I found him snooping around downstairs. Where? A little while ago. Did he see you? Yes. Annie, he should have called me. He said he wanted a glass of water. But, Father, I gave him one, and at first he didn't drink it. He was looking for something. Maybe you're mistaken. I don't think he's a jewelry salesman. Why? His hands. They're not soft. They're like a, a laborer. Wait a minute, Annie. In this afternoon's mail, there's a letter from the Shelby Jewelry Company. Wait, I'll turn on the light and get it. I was so tired when I came home, I didn't even open it. There it is. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Brewster will come here. At the hope of your business in the future, that Mr. Brewster is a new man in this territory. But Annie, what? Listen to this. Mr. Brewster is anxious to help you. We will give you every chance to salvage what you can. We have given him the Western Territory because we felt that his knowledge of the district gained through traveling for the past 20 years for the Acme Gasoline Company. 20 years? Yes. But he's a young man. I know. Annie, we're going downstairs. What for? To call the police. I don't know what's happening here, but this man is an imposter. Come on. All right. Stand where you are. You're not calling the police or anybody else. Turn in just a minute to tonight's exciting FBI file. Before I give the special invitation I promised about the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan, let me first give you an idea of what Independent 60s means to you. Briefly, Independent 60s is a plan that makes you self supporting after your 60th birthday. No more job worries, no more money worries from then on. You're free and independent. 
free to live the life of independence you've always wanted. For many members, independent 60s means a home in a section in which they've always wanted to live. My wife and I just bought a farm in that heaven on earth, the Valley of Virginia. Four good acres with a little brook running through it. We're getting a big kick out of fixing up the old place. Yes, with an equitable society independent 60s plan, you've time to enjoy life to the fullest. Do the things you've always wanted. I find plenty of time now for my own special hobby, raising and training bird dogs. Well, maybe you can answer this one for me, Tom. Why is it everybody doesn't take advantage of the independent 60s plan? Oh, you know how people are, Mr. Keating. I was the same way myself. I used to think you had to be a rich man to afford a plan like this. But where did you get the facts? From my Equitable Society representative. He showed me how Social Security and the life insurance I already owned put me well along the way towards independent 60s. Yes, that's the surprising thing about it all. In so many cases, it takes only a small amount of additional insurance to enable a man to look forward with complete confidence to independent 60s. A few extra dollars a week did it for me. So why not see your equitable representative without delay? Phone him soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Out of a Storm. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI points up one important fact that it would like to impress our new listeners. The young man who came to the home of Mr. Sanders and his daughter was already guilty of having committed a brutal murder, of having by design and forethought killed a man for profit. And yet, despite that fact, he was personable enough to have been invited into a reputable person's home as a guest. The point your FBI would like to bring home to you is that there was no way of determining from his appearance that this young man was a vicious, homicidal maniac. No one is to be blamed for having made the mistake, because similar mistakes are being made this very moment in various parts of the nation. It is not within the province of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, nor is it their desire to ask you to be suspicious of every stranger you meet. But it does request that you investigate every stranger you do business with. And certainly that you examine every stranger you invite into your home. The night's file continues later in the Sanders' home. What time is it, Mr. Sanders? Ten minutes past eight. It's been a long night. Look, can my daughter go back to bed? Uh, Never mind, Father. I prefer to be with you. Uh, what time do you usually open up your store? Nine o'clock. And how long does it take you to get there from here? Half hour. Then you better get ready to go into town. What for? Get the jewelry. Bring it back here to me. I can't do that. It doesn't belong to you. Please don't argue, Mr. Sanders. But I'm not blood. I have a gun here. When you go into town, your daughter stays here with me. If you do as I say, she won't get hurt a bit. You understand? I think I do. All right, you better get going. Father, I've Father... got to do as he says, Emmy. Now, one thing, Mr. Sanders. What? I know how long it takes to drive to town. If you are gone too long, there'd only be one thing for me to do. I'd have to kill your daughter and leave. Your call gone through yet, Jim? The one of the Shelby Jewelry Company? Yeah. I just finished talking with them. What did they have to say? Well, Brewster's next stop was to have been a small town upstate. You know, I think the killer might have gone there in his place. Why? Well, Brewster was carrying a letter of introduction to the local jeweler up there. It stated that there was a consignment of jewelry to be picked up. By Brewster? That's right. You know the name of the jeweler? Sanders. Well, how about calling him? I've been trying to ever since the New York call went through. Busy? No answer. How about his home? No answer there either. Oh. I asked the switchboard to try both numbers again in 15 minutes. Earl, if there's still no answer, we'll call the local police, have them start checking, then get up there ourselves. Hello? 
Your father's due back here now, Miss Sanders. I hope he's late. Huh? I hope he goes to the police instead of to a store. That's not wishing yourself any good. Your threats don't bother me. Well, they will if I use this gun. You wouldn't dare. Miss Sanders, up to now I've had a lot of respect for the way you operate. I even like the fact that you figured out I was a phony. There's one thing about me you've messed up on. When I say I'm going to do something, I really do it. And I told your father that I'd kill you if he didn't come back right away. I meant it. Now, if he isn't here in just three minutes more, I will kill you. What will that prove? That I'm a man of my word. Father? Yes, Annie? We're in here. Oh, you just beat the deadline, Mr. Sanders. Is that the jewelry? Yes. Oh, let me have a look at it. Yes. And the door. Yes, Father. This has been terrible for you. It's over now, Father. Oh, it's a very nice collection. You got what you wanted. Will you get out of here? Sure. Uh, don't take your coat off, Mr. Sanders. Huh? We're leaving. We? Ah, oh, we're going for a ride. You can't do this. Now, don't feel hurt, miss. You're coming with us. Oh, look. I'd be pretty foolish to leave both of you here. He'd call the police as soon as I went out that door. Look, will you take me? Let Annie stay. Sorry, can't do it. Get a coat for him, huh? I won't. Do I have to keep reminding you of this gun? I'll use it, Mr. Sanders. I swear to you I will. Get me a coat, Father. Now, that's the girl. You know, I, I don't see why you're making such a fuss about this. It's a beautiful day. Nice ride. Fresh air. It'll do us all good. Where are you taking us? I'll let you know when we get there. Come on. Give me your hand, baby. Yeah, I'll feel better if you'll walk in front of me. Come on, dear. I don't have to remind you both what would happen if you got out of line, do I? No. Come here, dear. Thank you. you. Smell that air? It's always so clean after the storm. Now, we'll use your car, Mr. Sanders. That's it right there. Yes. The police might be looking for the one I came in. I think it'd be best if you drive, too. Very well. Father, I hear someone. What? She's right. I see him. The police. Thank you. He's not taking me. Killer? No, not yet. Well, let's have the story on the getaway. Well, the killer was leaving the house with Sanders and his daughter and a policeman arrived. The killer went for his gun, wounded the policeman, used Miss Sanders as a shield and hit cover, and then he ran away. Did they get the right name of the killer? No. But we still don't know who he is. That's right. Oh, I did get a description of him. Well, why didn't you call me at headquarters, Jim? We could have sent out a new alarm. I don't think we need it. Why? Miss Sanders told me the killer knows about a cave that's on a hill behind their house. He headed up that hill when he ran away from the police. We're on our way there now. Very place, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. Only a room for him to hide, too. I don't know. Well, at least we know he's in here. Are those kids sure they saw him go in? Yeah. And they didn't see him come out again. And there's only one exit. That's what. Hey, Jim. What? Did you say he fired any shots when he was running away? That's right, too. What kind of a gun do you have? Did you hear it's possible we got four shots to duck. Uh, hey, hold it. Thought I heard something. Come on. Might be around any of these turns, huh? Mm-hmm. Hold on. That's got to be here. Let's see if we can make this any easier. All right. Wherever you are, you'd better come out and come out peacefully. Come and get me. Yeah, there's your answer. Yeah. Well, 
around here and keep shooting. Yeah, this path winds around. You have to be able to shoot around corners to hear Come on. That should leave him with only two bullets. Yeah, it should. He says he's pretty close now. One bullet left. Yeah, it should. Hey, I think he's right around this next band. Mm-hmm. Where are you going in? Cover me. Okay, Jim. Identification of the body of Roy Grant by Mr. Sanders and his daughter as the man who had impersonated the murdered Mr. Brewster was a mere formality. And after it, tonight's file was closed. And so another of the 13,000 murders committed in this country in the past 12 months was solved. Not all of the others have been solved yet. And it must seem to the killers, as it probably occurred to the one in tonight's case, that murder is an easy crime to commit and to get away with. But the records prove that the contrary is true. All murders may not be solved as quickly as this one. But if the crime involves the violation of a statute over which the Federal Bureau of Investigation has jurisdiction, then no matter how long it takes, whether the time be days, weeks, months, or years, they are worked on by the special agents of your FBI until the criminal is captured. When robbery accompanies the murder, as it did in this case, those special agents work not only to capture the killer, but also to recover the stolen property. For only in that way do they continue to fulfill their job. Their job of protecting the lives and property of you, the American people. Just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, two final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Mr. Keating, I've just passed my 40th birthday. Is that too late to start one of these plans? No. Your Equitable representative will tell you that many men start their Independent 60s plan at about your age. Well, after I'm 60, what sort of an income will this plan give me? The exact figure depends on what you can afford to pay now and your future needs. Your equitable representative will gladly work it out for you. Ask him to drop around for a friendly visit. Phone him soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of a criminal double cross. Its subject, swindling. Its title, The Lawsoner's Bride. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Bill Conrad, Olive Deering, and Tom Holland. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Larcenous Bride on This is Your FBI. This is ABC. The American Broadcasting Company.